Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the regular roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. Sophie Vlogs! In an exciting twist, today's book chat is all non-fiction. I understand that might not be everyone's jam. If you're a solely fiction reader, please go listen to another book chat, and I'll be back next week with some more fiction. But today, I just thought I would go for it. I will kick things off with Eat, Sweat, Play, How Sport Can Change Our Lives by Anna Kessel. I was really interested to pick this one up because essentially, I don't think I'm the only person who was mildly scarred by secondary school PE lessons to the extent where it has like, for the rest of my life, affected how I approach exercise. But I am working to unpick some of that. I also have my own things to do. I've mentioned I have terrible skin. One of the things about it is that if I get remotely hot and sweaty, I break out into hives very easily. So a personal journey that I have been on is to find ways of moving that work around these things that I have, both physical and like mental hang-ups. Picking up this was part of my effort to sort of reconfigure my brain. And I did really appreciate that aspect of it. There are a lot of the earlier chapters are just talking about like um, how and why so many women get put off of exercise and sport and made to feel like it's not a place for them. Ways of challenging that, and I really appreciated those. There's also a lot of this that is just sort of like to do with um, sport and topics. Like she has a whole chapter that's about menstruation, she has a whole chapter that's about like pregnancy and menopause and that kind of thing. And these are things that I've never read about in relation to sport and I also found that really really interesting. A final pro is it is also written in a way that is I think very accessible. Like it did feel a lot of the time, and this is either a pro or a con depending on what your preferences are, kind of felt a lot of the time like an online article just extended into a book. Some of my cons would be, and I feel bad critiquing this one because this is just the nature of like books get published and time passes, I think this was published 2016-2017. Uh, Obviously things have changed, there are some parts of this where I almost wish we had like an extra chapter at the end where she was like revisiting, which is I know not how books work. But, um, for example, she does briefly mention a transgender man in this. A lot of the language used around that is quite outdated. Similarly, some of these topics, it was interesting in many ways, because some of these topics, you know, it's like, here we were in 2017, and then we've moved to new places now. In some ways, those are good things, like she's talking about women's football a lot in this, and the WSL has a much bigger presence, I feel, now than it used to. And we are having um, women included in panels. The Euros like had a lot more women included in the discussion panels and that kind of thing. Um, some of the negatives is the, for example, she does talk about motherhood and exercise in regards to like um, professional athletes. I think you just have to look at the Olympics and their approach to uh, athletes who needed to bring their children with them. Similarly, she mentions Cassius Mayer in this, but um, this this discussion of um, testosterone levels in women um, is something, again, we have seen much more recently being used in ways to punish women, but also specifically punish black women. And I think one of my other critiques of this is that although she does at times talk about things like not being able-bodied or being a woman of colour and how these experiences are different, she didn't really go into them in a lot of depth. And I think there were there were some times when some of her arguments she was making, I would have liked to have seen them be taken that little bit further, explored in a bit more nuance in regards to some of these topics and just acknowledging the ways that these experiences can be different based on these aspects of your identity. Um, she does, and again, I don't want to sound like she doesn't touch on any of those, because she does, it's just they're like sort of little touches, whereas, I don't know, maybe it's just where we are now, I feel like there is a lot more um, focus and discussion on these things. On the whole, um, as someone who previously would not have said I was a very sporty person, I did find a lot of this very interesting. I think what I was looking for was a lot more of the the sections that were talking about, like, normal women and their relationships to sports. I did find the sections on professional athletes interesting, but they were less, like, what I thought the book was going to be about. I thought it was more going to be about, like, reconfiguring, like, personal relationships rather than necessarily, you know, you get about halfway through and you're just like, yes, I do know that women are discriminated against in sport, but let's keep, you know, there's just like a lot of examples given and I was like, I am aware. 
by now. Next up is Cry Freedom, the legendary true story of Steve Biko and the friendship that defied apartheid by John Briley. This is the um, this is a novel adapted from the screenplay of the movie with the same name. I realise I have not told you what this book is about. This is about uh, Steve Biko, who was an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, and his friendship that he developed with Donald Woods, who was a white editor of a newspaper who originally was quite anti his views, but they ended up meeting and then um, they formed a friendship, and this book follows their story. The plus side of these of this aspect of it being an adapted screenplay is that it is very visual, like you can see how it would have been filmed and you get these these very cinematic, like you get a scene from a perspective and then you get a different scene and a different scene. And I could see it and I felt rooted in it. The um, negative aspect of that is that you do jump around a lot and you're not necessarily always, like you, you largely revolve around Donald Woods, um, but you're not always like necessarily rooted in like people and character like I especially because I was also experiencing Steve Biko from Donald Woods's perspective I didn't always necessarily feel like I, I wanted more of him frankly which I realize is not what this narrative is telling this narrative is telling about their friendship and how um, Steve Biko affected Donald Woods it's not exploring all about Steve Biko on his own terms and I think maybe that is something that I should go off and follow up with my own reading and that kind of thing. This is another one which I would say is extremely easy to read, again because it is an adapted screenplay. I also think that the um, the language is very easy to read and it read very quickly for me. So I think that, again, like people who want to get a better understanding of this but maybe don't read a lot of non-fiction will find this very accessible. Um, I It's one of those where, like, it's based on real events. I can't fault any of the things that happened, and I think it is a, a story that I'm glad to know more about now. I want to go off and do more reading on Steve Biko as a person and uh, his words and that kind of thing, but I, I'm glad I read it. I had an enjoyable time reading it. Um, you know sometimes you read things and you're like, but I want more. <laughs> That's where I'm at, at with that. The third book I want to talk about is I Saw Ramala by Maurid Barghouti, which is translated by Adas Suef. Maurid Barghouti is a Palestinian poet. This is his account of returning to Palestine, specifically Ramallah, where he's from. And um, it's kind of just an account of this trip and this visit. But he is reflecting across all of his life. He's reflecting across um, some of these big life events that have affected him deeply, like um, he, his, or his older brother who really desperately wanted to be able to return to Palestine but wasn't able to and died before he could and the impact that's had on his life. Um, there's a lot of reflecting upon his status as a displaced person. It really, it, it suffuses everything within this I feel because um, you you get to see what it's like being a displaced person when you're forbidden from being in your country, like what it is like for him in the different places he has lived, the the transient nature of his life that it's it, he is he has lived in many different countries, but because they are all not his own country, there's a, a similarity there between his experience and um, despite what these countries are actually like. Um, but then equally, his status as a displaced person is still present when he returns because he is different from the people who were not made to leave. And sometimes the way that they, like he, there's like a observation about all of the flags everywhere and that kind of thing and he, how he can't connect to that. And it's, it's, I think he does a really great job of He's, he's giving you this account of his return and you're following what he's doing, but he is so good at capturing how he feels, what this moment feels like for him, the, the conflict of emotion, because there's joy and there's sadness all at the same time. And I just, you can tell he's a poet as a start point, but then also because this is translated, um, what a brilliant job of translation to be able to retain that poeticism in a completely different language. Um, I don't know, I felt like this was done really, really well, especially, it feels especially pertinent given this current moment that we are in, and it is in many ways deeply sad reading about where he is at here and then just comparing it to where we are at now, um, and how much he has hope for things and it's, it's very sad 
acknowledging that I think a lot of the hopes that he had for things have really not been fulfilled and things have objectively gotten a lot worse. Um, I will have some resources in the link description down below about ways you can donate to Palestinian relief funds and stuff like that. I include them on a bunch of my videos, not just this one, but it feels especially pertinent to do it on this one. Um, yeah, I found this very affecting, and I think it was, uh, again, it was another one that was a very quick read in many ways. It's not very long, and it is uh, quite big text, and it's it's written, again, in a, almost like a stream of consciousness way sometimes, and I know that I'm a person who keeps saying that I'm terrible at reading stream of consciousness things, but in this case it really worked for me because it's not so stream of consciousness that it's like sentences flowing on from each other and on from each other. It's more stream of consciousness in the way that you're always so aware of how he is feeling in the moment and how he exists in the moment regardless of what is actually happening you're getting the events but you're so rooted in his experiences and his emotions the final book i want to talk about is one i read on my kindle i also read kitchen confidential by anthony bourdain which was um just a fun little read to be honest with you anthony bourdain was an incredibly famous american chef uh, i have watched some of his documentaries i was interested in reading kitchen confidential because i love reading food writing but the type of food writing that i previously have read is extremely different to what kitchen confidential is this is very much giving you like the dirt the nitty gritty on like what actually being a chef in a professional kitchen in America is like um it's like described you know like the sex drugs rock and roll sort of side but also just like the filth the dirt the the honest um the honesty of it in some ways it's interesting because it's also a snapshot of the time that it's written and I imagine things are a bit different but also like there was a whole chapter where he's talking about um the bad reasons for going for starting uh, a restaurant if you have no experience in it and his 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 rules like don't do this don't do this and frankly it just read like an episode of kitchen nightmares <laughs> which was very funny it's interesting getting an understanding of how he started his career how his career has grown like i know him as an incredibly successful chef but then you get to see frankly all of his failures which is in some ways you know there's always this idea that like you know when people become successful everyone sort of downplays the struggles that they had to get there they're like oh but you're so successful and it's like no this is the reality of how you how i got here similarly like he does a lot of advice for like okay so what are the key parts of a professional kitchen that you as a amateur home chef might actually find useful that was really interesting um kitchen culture how things function that kind of thing i gave this a three out of five stars because i had a really fun time reading it and i enjoyed it it didn't like blow my socks off but um i didn't think it was going to um i just enjoyed it uh, those are everything I want to talk about for this week. I would love to hear your thoughts on any of them. Please do leave a comment down below. Otherwise, I hope you have a lovely day. I will see you next time for something different.